In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. The ruling on the field stands. We deliver jerseys, funny foam fingers, and everything you need for the game. But what you really get is so much more. FedEx delivery. Game day spirit. What we deliver by delivering. Welcome back to the Daily Memphian Memphis Tigers podcast. This is your host, Drew Hill. I'm back last after uh, missing last week. For Just a skipping the podcast. Bit of a dental emergency. No, but dental we, emergency. But we, we are back. We're good now. Uh, ready to go. I'm joined, as always, by Jonah Jordan, Memphis Tigers football beat writer. Not a lot of football news going on right now, so we'll just get into basketball right away. Not a fan of uh, spring practice, I guess. No, not not quite yet. Uh, anyway, we have some basketball news. Uh, yesterday, DJ Jeffries is out for the rest of the season now. If you were paying attention, if you are a Memphis basketball fan, that should come as no surprise to you. That was uh, after the initial four to six weeks that was thrown out there at the beginning. I think that it was always seemed like he was always what was yeah, yeah. going to make sense and what was going to happen. Um, DJ will now finish out the rest of the year rehabbing. He'll test the NBA waters, and which is one thing I want to get to. I hope this isn't a secret, and I'll whisper it. Just Oh, do we? Careful. are we telling secrets? They're all going to test oh, the yeah, NBA they're all, waters. They're yeah. all going to go to the NBA. Yeah. Combine gonna, if they can, and they're going to okay, work out Okay, you sound like teams. you've been smoking Marlboros. Yeah. Like, um, they're all going to do it. It's what makes sense. It's free evaluation from the NBA. There's it's no the smart reason thing to, to get. Yeah, there's no reason to get worked up about that or any no a, a, any other NBA you expect dj back next year back in memphis that's why his dad has been seems like he was pretty adamant yesterday that he would be back in memphis if the nba thing didn't work out um it will depend on those nba evaluations i think right if the thing is now you don't even have to get drafted to yeah start an nba career like no, the goal could, is to get a two-way contract mm-hmm. right and If DJ goes to a team and he can get guaranteed a a two-way contract or, you know, could have a a career where it looks like he's on the path to the NBA um, and he doesn't need to go back to college, then, like, even if you're not going to get drafted, like, look at the – I don't have the numbers in front of me, but look at the numbers last year. There were so many more guys that left and stayed in the draft than the amount that could get drafted. So – um I think it will all depend on those so, NBA evaluations, which I can't tell you right now how they're going to go. But yeah. I, I mean, well, I here's think my Memphis thing obviously DJ. expects him back and hopes that he's back. Here's my thing with DJ. If he comes back next year, I think he will be one of those second-year forward guys that you see break out and jumps up in the mock drafts, jumps up in the – it's going to be a good draft next year. You have those guys – what, those guys who can skip next year? Or is that I the believe year? it's uh, one year after that, 2021. It's looking like is will be Yeah, that would year. be the 2021 draft is the next year. Right. After well, his sophomore year of college. That so can go about. straight where high schoolers yeah. can go straight to the league. So correct. that is going to be a good draft after next season. But it'll be a quote double draft. Yeah, it'll I be guess, the double draft. That's that. what the what the term is. But I think he could be really, really good. Like if he comes out, he could be a guy like that could average like twenty points a game, I think. I think I maybe I think my opinion of him is very high. I think he is gonna be could be really good next year. He'll be a little older put a little bit more strength in a little bit better three point shooter, a little bit better dribbling. Like I think he could absolutely develop into a stud prospect. I agree with you. And I think that's also the reason why it becomes shaky, whether or not an NBA team will also see that as this guy is primed to make a big leap in his game. And so therefore, you know, we're willing to take a chance on him. Like that's, that's the danger of this yeah. thing, right? Um, but if he does come back to Memphis, I totally agree. Um, I think that he would be a fantastic second-year player, especially when you look at DJ when he first came into into college. He was this high-volume scorer in high school, and um, he got in much better shape almost right away. Yeah. He dropped a lot of his body fat. 
Um, he was because one of the guys people- that transformed himself rather quickly. Mm-hmm. Another year of that, man, I mean, he should be punishing people yeah. out there next year. And I'm just like, we can talk about the NCAA tournament stuff in a little bit. We've talked about it to death, but... Right now, my focus kind of moved towards next season because I don't think they are making the NCAA tournament. I don't think um, that will end up happening. But So you kind of look towards next season a little bit. Lester Quinones and DJ Jeffries could be... I mean, that's an insane combination for next season. If, if you can keep both of those guys, you can keep them, and you develop them... Like where where does that even just those two guys? I think that puts you in the upper half of the league, and then you keep you look at Tower, Alo. Those guys can get better. Malcolm Dandridge will be way better next season, I think, in his second year. Once he he needs to go go into a summer where he gets a full summer of conditioning and doesn't have to rehab the whole time. He doesn't have to worry about his knee hurting or this, that, and the other. I really like next year's team could be very, very, very good just because they are developing these guys. But are they in any danger of losing anybody because? It is college basketball. Right. There is movement. Look, and you don't want to put names out there because you don't want... Yeah. You don't want to force kids out. You don't want people to panic. You don't panic want to get upset. Or, like, it's just not... It's not, it's it not worth early. it to do that. Right. It's too early and it's not worth it to do that. But uh, from a general perspective, of course, like, look at what Penny has said about this. Um, and in particular about the transfer rule where if you, if it does pass this summer and you don't have to sit out a year to transfer, I think there is a possibility that you could lose a lot of guys just because it's an opportunity for other coaches to make promises that you're going, that they'll be able to play X amount of minutes and take X amount of shots that Memphis can't promise, you know? Um, And so I think it is a bit of a danger if that happens that now at the same time, it's an opportunity for Memphis to bring guys in, right? It's like it's a bit of a catch-22. You get both sides of this, uh, yeah. pluses and minuses, um, if that were to happen. In general, like, if you were to ask me, do I think anyone's going to transfer at the end of the season, I would tell you yes. Like, just look at the climate of college basketball. People transfer it's all easy, the time. It's an easy bet to make just because of the exactly. climate of college basketball. Not because of what's going on in Memphis, but because college basketball is constructed in the way that it is that – I mean, guys transfer a lot. Do you? Do I think you should be panicking about like some sort of mass exodus about if these players? Yeah, that's if, more if, of the if question. If that can happen, no, I, I I don't think so right now. Like, I don't think you should be worried about that yet. Um, but again, if the rule changes and it becomes that easy to just switch teams and and go play somewhere else, like that's that would be a big curveball in this. That would be a big change because. You have guys, and I don't want to, again, don't want to point out anybody in specifics, but people who are bench players or who aren't playing the amount of minutes that they want to play, that they think they should be playing, where another team could promise them that they're a starter and could play a lot of minutes right away. Like that would be enticing for anybody. So uh, I think that's something to certainly keep your eye on. Um, and again, I don't. I don't foresee Memphis striking out and recruiting. I don't foresee there being a mass exodus right now. Um, they will some way or somehow have a, a good roster going into next season because, like as you've mentioned, they've got so many different options of guys that could make a big leap. Um, and then there's options as far as, you know, you, you could see transfers. You could see, And if they can play right away, oh, yeah. that's a benefit. You could see grad transfers who – in the current construction of this team would fit pretty well because they're looking for some toughness uh, here and they some just leadership. Need a dude, at games. point guard, uh, just a point guard, just that could play. You that could play with Halo, could play in front of him, could play with Tyler, could play in front of him. Just a dude that can go out there and get you a bucket. And you can find that whether or not it is Jalen Green or if it's a graduate transfer. And look, the reality of the situation is you're only going to have either one for one year anyway, right? So, yeah. um, of course, you want the exciting guy who could get drafted first overall um, if you have the choice. But they won't strike out. They they definitely will not so strike who you, out. So who are you fighting for for Jalen Green? It's Auburn, Memphis, Oregon, and overseas. Or is the overseas option done, or do we know? Um, I, I think you're probably fighting with Auburn and Oregon and overseas. I think that's a, 
I guess, I guess that would be maybe is right. that over Memphis right now is the leader for Jalen Green, no question. Yeah. Like uh, if the current staff is together at the end of the season and is back next year, Jalen Green will be here. You, know, you can't make any promises because Memphis has a superstar staff of assistants who all could get head coaching jobs, right? So Cody Topper. I think Cody Topper could end up with a uh, could get a head coaching job if you want to just listen to the guy talk. I mean, he's he's being able brilliant. to talk doesn't no that doesn't. I mean, but he's been an NBA assistant. He's been a head coach at the G League level. Like okay, you know, there are, there are several. I'll ride with you a little bit are, on that one. There are several. Uh, there are several. You know, different directions. I mean, I I'm mean, not saying he's considering. I'm not. I'm not. Suggesting no, I know that. What I'm you're just saying. saying like they have a superstar staff of assistants, right? This is so, a lot like what Mike Norvell had to deal with every year. Is that these guys are really good. Exactly. They may not be looking to leave, but opportunities are going to pop up. Exactly. That may be too hard to turn out. And that is what you're saying. Not everybody's like trying to run out of Memphis, but exactly. that opportunities are going to come up and something could it arise. It will be hard to say. It might be hard to say no. Like it's just the same with anybody in any job, you know? Um, but I'm just saying, as of right now, Memphis is the leaders for Jalen Green and Greg Brown. Um, Tell me about Isaiah Stokes. How, how's he doing these days? I like we haven't heard a lot about him at this time last year. We're talking about Lance Thomas. How's Lance looking in practice? How's everything going with him? Now let's talk about Isaiah. How's how's everything looking with him? How have you heard anything? How is he as a player? What can you give us on Isaiah Stokes? I have had limited interactions with Isaiah. I chatted him, chatted with him first. Um, brief minute before one of the games and just asked him how everything was going. And it's he a big said, dude. Yeah, he is a big dude. He said everything's been going great. I told him I liked the ESPN Plus episode where he <laughs> was in Chings watching the Tennessee game. Um, he seems like he's got a good attitude about all of this. Oh, no, the Stokes the Stokes brothers are awesome. I Like, I've never had or thought a bad interaction or thought, man, this guy, you know, because I was around when Isaiah was in high school and then everybody obviously with Jarnell – um, when he went to Tennessee, but I've never been around either one of them and been like, man, these guys, they, they seem to get it. They seem like good dudes. So it seems like he has a good attitude. I, I think that the coaches would have liked to have him this year. They could certainly use another big body, uh, especially in games like the game at SMU where Precious is picking up air quotes, foul calls um, oh all the time. I mean, some of those are terrible. The first one was totally foul, but the, the next three were very questionable. Um, really could have used a guy like Isaiah in the paint um, who can get go get you a rebound and be a bully down there, and unfortunately they don't have him. And it would just be – I would just feel bad for Isaiah if they pass this transfer rule one year after he has to sit out, you know? Yeah, that's brutal. Like, that that's just brutal sucks. Luck. That sucks for him. You know, you you spent this whole year sitting out, and then next year, any guy who transfers into the program can just yeah play right and just away. do whatever he wants. That'd so, be a horrible feeling. Okay, so who's left on the schedule? Can you give people a little quick rundown on what on what Memphis has left to do before the conference tournament. Okay, a um, couple things are still up in the air. They have Wichita State and Houston left in the regular season. Yep, Wichita one home, State, one away. Thursday night. Yep, one home, one away. Um, they are tied with SMU in the conference standings, although SMU has the tiebreaker over Memphis. And um, they are a game behind Wichita State. Now, uh, before we get into the NCAA tournament, let's talk conference tournament because – they're the number four seed in a first round buy is still on the table. There's just a couple of scenarios that have to happen. The first is they have to finish ahead of SMU. They can't tie with SMU in any way because SMU is the tiebreaker. Yeah. Um, that means Memphis either has to finish two and zero, which I think is the more unlikely scenario, and and SMU Memphis finishes two and zero and SMU finishes one and one, or Memphis finishes one and one with a win over Wichita State. Because in that case, Wichita State would have the tiebreaker and a loss to Houston. And SMU finishes 0-2. SMU's final two games of the season are UCF and South Florida. So first first things first, Memphis has to finish ahead of SMU. They have to in in two games left, they have to go two and zero and SMU has to go one and one, or they have to go one and one and SMU has to go 0 and two. Now, if you beat Wichita State, you have pretty much every single tiebreaker over Wichita State. Um, because Wichita State is 0-2 against Houston, 0-2 against Cincinnati, and 0-1 against Tulsa with one game left. 
and Men- against Tulsa. And Memphis doesn't have another game against Tulsa, so you can't win the tiebreaker even if you beat Tulsa in the last in the last game. So Memphis, in pretty much every scenario, has the tiebreaker over Wichita State, um, which would mean. If you tied Wichita State for the fourth spot and SMU finishes behind you, like we have yeah. already set up, then Memphis would still get a first round bye. Best thing they can do, go two and zero oh and hope that yeah, just hope uh, that SMU it, yeah. goes one and one. And I think with SMU having two road games back to back, it's and possible them not being very good the last few games. Besides, obviously, when they played Memphis, it's not off the table. I really, I really think that it's still a possibility. And now we'll take a break for a message from our sponsor. The Daily Memphian Tigers podcast is brought to you by FedEx. Possibilities. What we deliver by delivering. So, let's look at it. Say Memphis goes 2-0. They do what you say. Do what you say. They go into the conference tournament. Who do you think they don't want to play? I don't want to. If I were Memphis, I don't want to see South Florida. And that seems crazy, Yeah, it's insane. But they've struggled with them all year. I'm talking about in a first round matchup, obviously, in your first game. You don't want to play South Florida because one, South Florida is a physical team, and they've also given you a lot of trouble this year. Memphis probably should have lost that game at South Florida. And then they came back here and South Florida beat them at home. They have very physical, good, experienced guards that have Create given turnovers. Memphis trouble and have created turnovers, which we all know is Memphis's weakness. Um, that's not the first round team I want to play. No, that, I would Tulsa. Where's Tulsa in the standings right now? Give her because I think that team is very Tulsa. Good. I believe is tied for first. Oh, are they really? Uh, okay, with Houston. That's a good. Frank hates a really good coach. So we were at the AAC tournament before, or not tournament. We were at AAC media day before the season started, and I was talking to Frank Hayes. Talked to him for a while, and he never really seemed to. He he was like, "We're flying under the radar," but he was like, "We could be pretty good." He's like, people talk about Memphis, they talk about Houston, they talk about Wichita State. He's like, but we're putting something together here. And he seemed pretty confident, and then they went and backed it up. I mean, that's a tough, fun team that they, they beat Memphis. And, it, like, at first you look at it, you're like, man, they lost to Tulsa. And then they are tied at 12-4 and four with Houston uh, atop the conference. Okay. Uh, with a game, I know they have a game against Wichita State left, which will be You important. have the whole schedule memorized. I love it. Um. I had to go through it, man. I had to <laughs> dig into that to figure out those tiebreakers are not as easy as you think. Um, and hopefully I'm not telling people wrong because yeah. it's a lot of math. And so I journals and we talked about that. Oh, yeah, I don't do math either. So we talked about that. Memphis's path a little bit, who they would and wouldn't want to play. Here's something I texted you about the other day and you didn't answer me. Uh, but who is going to be the AAC player of the year? Oh, because I think Precious has a, I mean, he gets fresh. He he should be the freshman of the year. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I think Precious is the best player in the conference, and I think he should be the player of the year. I have no confidence that the coaches, because the coaches are who votes in the AAC, and they voted him what at the beginning of the he season? Wasn't first he wasn't first or second team. First or second team, which yeah. is so Insane. asinine when you look at it now. Like just incredibly stupid, just laughably dumb um, when you look back at it now. But, and I guess they didn't know that James wasn't going to be around, and so maybe they thought that Precious wouldn't have the numbers because James would intrude on that. But that it just looks so stupid now. I think Precious is the best player in the conference. I don't have any confidence whatsoever that the coaches are going to vote him as the player of the year simply because they're going to vote for a player on one of the teams that's you know, first or finishes in first or second. Like, you know, you've got Precious and you've got Caleb Mills, who are both freshmen, right? Yeah. Um, one at Houston, who's their leading Caleb Mills scorer, is good just really good. And then one at Memphis. Technically, because they're both freshmen, if they were to give the best player on the best team player of the year, and let's, let's just say they, that they gave it to Caleb Mills. He should be the freshman of the year too, right? Yes, it would that, only make logically sense. that that is the. But path I you have follow. a feeling that, like, knowing today's day and age, that they would just split them, and that somebody would win freshman of the year, or somebody would win player of the year. I think again, I maintain I think Precious is the best player in the conference, but I just have no faith in these coaches. I, history tells us that you should have no Greg faith Marshall in the AAC coaches. This and be very upset with you. I don't care what Greg avid Marshall does. daily Memphian. 
Memphis Tiger podcast listener, Greg, Greg Marshall. Greg Marshall got mad because somebody asked him a question with the word quantify. If you don't, if you nice. can't figure out what quantify means, you shouldn't be able to vote. On Kelvin AAC Sampson made fun of me at AC Media Day, and I've not forgiven him for that. Just as that's where we are right now. That's where we are. Anyway, the coaches, so, the coaches, I like. If I know, then they have some old school coaches here now. You yeah. got you've got guys like Brian Gregory at USF calling Penny and Mike the <laughs> hip, the hip happening coaches. They're old school. I don't. No, this, I, I don't trust them. I think Memphis is going to get kind of yeah, kind of jobbed on the the postseason awards for sure. I mean, Precious will be first team all conference for sure. Where's anybody else? I mean, DJ's injury obviously hurt some old. Hurts in that I, because I think he would have been first first team all conference too. Yeah, I don't think you're going to see anybody else. Yeah, I don't think so either. So I, I mean, maybe one. like maybe you see a guy like Lester on a second team. Yeah, but that's a big maybe. Big. I mean, maybe. I, I like. I think Precious is going to be the only one that you're going to see. Um, and I don't. Like again, don't think he'll be player of the year. I hope he is. I think he's very deserving. Yeah, but let's talk I don't a little think football case because we do have spring practice coming away. I know it is a few weeks away, but I think people are pretty excited. I think this is most people are most people have been excited for spring football in some time. I I'm not particularly excited for spring football. You're a hater, man. I look look. Uh, Here's the thing: when when your season ends, basketball is still going on, right? <laughs> yeah, and so you you know you're exhausted. I've been well, exhausted. By the time the conference months. tournament is over, I'm going to be. Oh no! You're I'm going to be ready be... for my vacation. Vacation? No, I don't know where I'm going, but I'll I'll figure it out. But so okay, spring football. What we're looking for? So one big thing. One big thing I'm looking for is you know pretty early I was able to identify Kenneth Gainwell as a guy who's going to break out. I written about him. I talked about him a million times. Every time somebody's like, "Hey, who's going to be the guy to replace Daryl Henderson?" This, that, and the other. I was like, "Kenny Gainwell." Pat yourself on the back there. Oh, absolutely! I'm awesome. So now you're going into the spring, looking like, okay, who can replace that Antonio Gibson? Who's going to be the next kind of guy? And that's kind of something I wanted going that we should be able to see during the spring. Who's going to be that guy who can come in and can can play and come produce in this offense and I, I think that's going to be something that's very interesting names like Taj Washington Javon Ivory at receiver uh somebody who kind of flying under the radar right now but were you at the Navy game I don't remember I that was seems like that a, was a, a Thursday million, night that feels like a billion years ago um Gabe Rogers he ran back that kick and I think I mean Memphis is going to need kick returners this year because Antonio Gibson, Chris Claybrooks, Trevon Samuel, Trevion Samuel all graduated. So I think Gabe Rogers is going to be a guy people are going to learn about pretty quickly. Um, but no, excited about spring ball. Anything you're particularly looking forward to? I know you're not like super Brady. excited. Brady. We've seen Brady. We know what Brady is at this point. There I know. No I want to see if he can take it even a step further because I think his development, like he just – from the beginning of the season to the end, jumped so much. He was so good at the end of the season. I want to see if he can be even better. He made a couple of throws in that Penn State game that were like, man. I know. That that were like pro Ridiculous. Throws. Yeah. So, well, I think Brady, Brady interests me, and I'm interested to see what the secondary looks like because I think the secondary was a little shaky at the end of last and year. And they lost people from the secondary. I know. That's the bad part. Chris Claybrook. Well, it could be gone. good <laughs> well, given that they were shaky. No, because then the same people are back. TJ Carter and Jacoby Francis will be back. I mean, you're adding guys like Gabe Rogers into the mix. Um, the new guy they got just recently, Kofi from Mississippi. I like. There is going to be Did talent. Sanchez graduate? No, he's still there. He's back, right? Yes. yes. Your safeties will be the same. So... I think he's awesome. Oh yeah, Sanchez and Laundre are really good. You got to keep them healthy though. You need a. The problem is, is they have really no great slot corner. Laundre Thomas was playing slot corner for a lot of last season, and it just didn't work out. I think he's more of a safety than that. So they do have some things that Mike McIntyre has to figure out pretty quick. <laughs> pretty quick. Um, they're going to be finding positions for guys. They are switching to the three four, so they are going to be moving guys around. I think you'll see a lot of new positions that you probably aren't used to. You're going to see guys moving around places they probably haven't played before. Um, 
But, I mean, Memphis played a 3-4 two years ago, so a lot of these guys are pretty familiar with it already. It's just getting terminology down, getting where, where you need to be on a certain play, and this is what they dealt with last spring with Chris Ball. So a lot of these guys are used to change. Did you talk about the schedule on the last podcast? Oh, no, I didn't. What do you think about it? Uh, I mean, it's fine. I mean, they don't need to be playing UT Martin, UTSA. No, I Plain agree. And simple. That's disappointing. That needs to be done away with, and I wouldn't be shocked if you saw a different approach to scheduling under Laird Beach and Ryan Silver. It's just so hard. It just It's going to look like – that, but the reality is that these games have been scheduled so yeah. far in advance that like it's not on. It's so, not Laird Veach's fault. No, no, no. It's not Laird Ryan's fault. I wouldn't even say it's Mike's fault. Honestly, somebody else was doing the scheduling um, for a while there, and you kind of saw a shift towards how Norvell thought about things towards the end with that Arkansas game. They wanted to play regional rivals. I think MTSU, UAB, Southern Miss. I'm interested to see how Ryan takes takes that because. I do think they want to continue having one or two SEC games every year one or against another Power 5 program at least. You're going to see that with Purdue this year, and they really are going to need to win that Purdue game. Right, that's a winnable game. Well, it's also that, but it's also for your for – your, you want to make the Cotton Bowl. You want to be as ranked as highly as you can. Right, you got to beat your Power 5 teams. you got to beat that Power 5 team because Arkansas State, while that's going to be a fun game, that's not going to be a great win. They're going to blow UTSA out. They're going to blow UT Martin out. So it's a pretty, like, right off the rip. Like, that's pretty pretty tough. And they could, like, they could blow Arkansas State out. So I am interested to see. He'll probably talk about it this spring. His, I mean, how I think they're working on some stuff behind the scenes. Not well, really willing to talk about it yet. But uh, I wouldn't be shocked if we had some scheduling news over the summer, spring or summer. All right, that'll do it for us today. Uh, as always, you can follow Jonah on Twitter at underscore Jonah Jordan. You can follow me on Twitter at Drew Hill underscore DM. You can get this podcast or any other daily Memphian podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. Thanks for listening. Shoot it! Yeah! We deliver tickets, team merchandise, and everything you need for the game. But what you really get is so much more. FedEx delivery. Game day spirit. What we deliver by delivering. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community. The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.